This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. That wonderful TV year, 1987. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics, on iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher, or our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. Now, I've collected TV Guide fall preview issues throughout the years and thought it would be fun to talk about which shows made it, which didn't, and which ones we actually watched. I do have to give credit to Ken Reed's TV Guidance Counselor podcast for this idea. So, in 1987, on Saturday, we have... Once a Hero on ABC, a comic book writer, Abner, Milo O'Shea, is in a rut. His character, Captain Justice, has similar adventures over and over. Even the citizens of his, fic- his fictional town have noticed it. Lack of interest is making characters literally disappear, so the captain, Jeff Lester, comes out of the book and into our world where he has no powers. He teams up with Gumshoe, Robert Forster, a private dick also from this world, to solve real-world crimes. Sound needlessly complicated? It is. The premiere of this drama was preempted in many cities with the premiere of Star Trek Next Generation, which was in syndication, but many ABC affiliates picked it up. And the captain only lasted three episodes. Ironically, Jeff Lester had just come from a role in the film Star Trek IV. Milo O'Shea was far better known for the stage, winning two Tonys. Robert Forster was later nominated for an Oscar for Jackie Brown and has had a long career with 186 IMDb credits so far. Frank's Place, CBS. Tim Reed, Venus Flytrap of WKRP, plays a Boston College professor who inherits a New Orleans restaurant from his father and was from the same producers as WKRP. He plans to sell the restaurant, but voodoo waitress Miss Marie, Frances E. Williams, puts a hex on him, so his life falls apart back in Boston. So he returns, forced to run the restaurant, dealing with the staff, Chef Big Arthur, Tony Burton, bartender Tiger, Charles uh, Lampkin, head waitress Anna May, Francesca P. Roberts, as well as regulars such as lawyer Bubba, Robert Harper, and funeral home, home owner Bertha, Virginia Capers. There's also Bertha's lovely daughter Hannah, Daphne Maxwell Reed, Tim's actual wife. The dramedy had a slower pace to match the locale, which may have resulted in the single season. Despite that, it was nominated for an Emmy as Best Comedy and is considered a show that was canceled too soon. Mm -hmm. Daphne Maxwell Reed was the first African American model to get the cover of Glamour and would later be a regular on The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Legwork on CBS. Margaret Collins stars in this detective series about a former assistant district attorney, now a P.I. When she wasn't getting the bad guys, she commiserated with her friend still in the DA's office, Frances McDormand, and pulled info from her NYPD brother, Patrick James Clark. The name of the show was a reference to her shapely gams, which were front and center in many shots. Ironically, Colin was coming off a DA role in 1985's short-lived sitcom Foley Square. She would much later be a regular on Gossip Girl. Of course, Frances McDormand went on to be an Oscar-winning actress for Fargo and three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Moving on to Sunday. My Two Dads, NBC. Just to interject, this is the first one that I even recognize. (laughs) Michael, Paul Reiser, coming off Diner, Beverly Hills Cop, and Alien, and Joey, Greg Evigan, coming off BJ and the Bear several years earlier, find themselves sharing custody of teenager Nicole Stacy Keenan. They're, they were both boyfriends of Nicole's mom, who passed away, and since this was apparently an era before DNA tests, they all live in a funky NYC apartment. Michael is straight-laced, Joey is freewheeling, so it's the odd couple with the kid. Mm-hmm. They are monitored by the judge who made the call about all this, played by Florence Stanley, previously Mrs. Fish of Barney Miller. Giovanni Ribisi and Chad Allen played Nicole's competing boyfriends, and Dick, Dick Butkus was led, added later as the owner of a cafe in the building. The show ran for three seasons and would later hit a record for the highest syndication fee paid for it per episode, $250,000 per episode, by USA Network. 
Riser went on to Mad About You, Evigan to Tech War, and Keenan to Step by Step. Dolly on ABC. If anyone could resuscitate the variety show format, it was Dolly Parton. Of course, it had a country feel, with guests brought on to sing with the legend, along with sketches. Parton already had done a variety show in syndication a decade earlier, and ABC paid her $44 million for a two-year contract. The first episode got the highest rating for any series premiere. A Different World would beat it later that season. But it didn't hold up over time despite various adjustments and was gone after one season. This was the last gasp for the variety show format. Various attempts to return it so far had failed. Buck James on ABC. Dennis Weaver returns to TV as the head of a Texas hospital trauma unit. He works with a female, wah, chief resident, Alberta Watson, and a hospital administrator, John Cullum. He's also got three kids from a failed marriage to handle. Alberta Watson would go on to La Femme Nikita and John Cullum to Northern Exposure and two Tonys. Buck James only lasted a season. On Monday, we had Everything's Relative on CBS. Two brothers share a New York City apartment. One is sensible, the other carefree, but no kids this time. The sensible one is Jason Alexander, and the carefree one is John Bolger. Guess who had a bigger career? They both have to deal with their mother, played by Ann Jackson. The show lasted all of six weeks. Alexander went on to Seinfeld, Bolger on to Third Watch, and Jackson was far better known for her stage roles. Moving on to Tuesday. Jake and the Fat Man, CBS. William Conrad returns to TV as the latter part of a crime-fighting team. Conrad plays a district attorney, while Jake, Joey Penny, is his investigator. Jake lived the high life with expensive suits, a Porsche, a snazzy apartment. I guess investigating pays well. Yeah. Alan Campbell played the, the assistant DA. The show was originally set in Southern California, but moved to Hawaii after Magnum P.I. left the air, and then moved back to California. The series ran for five seasons. Now, one episode turned into a backdoor pilot for Dick Van Dyke's next series, Diagnosis Murder. J.J. Starbuck on NBC. Western TV stalwart Dale Robertson plays an eccentric Texas billionaire driving from town to town in a custom Lincoln convertible, helping people and solving crimes. The show was littered with his sayings. The way I look at life, only about 10% of it's what you make it. 90% is how you take it. Ben Vereen was brought in later, reprising his character from Ten Speed and Brown Shoe. The show lasted a season. 30-something on ABC, a sprawling ensemble drama that encapsulated the yuppies, starring Ken Olin, Mel Harris, Melanie Mayron, Peter Horton, Timothy Busfield, Patricia Wedig, and Polly Draper. This soapy series dealt with relationships, families, friends, and what we would call today first world problems of people with plenty of money. Highly influenced by the film The Big Chill, it was a big hit for ABC that ran for four seasons. Current shows like This Is Us might not exist if not for this series. Mm -hmm. Ken Olin and Peter Horton went on to directing. Timothy Busfield went on to The West Wing. The Law and Harry McGraw on CBS. Before his long run on Law & Order, Jerry Orbach played a disheveled P.I. in this spin-off of Murder, She Wrote. His Boston office is across the hall from a widowed criminal lawyer, Barbara Babcock. Shea Farrell played his nephew and assistant, while E.J. Brunson played her niece and junior partner. The show didn't last long enough for anyone to get together. Only 16 episodes. Moving on to Wednesday. The oldest rookie, CBS, in a concept that was just recycled yep. this past year, Paul Sorvino plays an administrative police chief who never, who is never a real cop on the streets, so he gives up his rank to go through the, the police academy. He and his new partner, D.W. Moffat, work under Raymond J. Berry, who's second in command. Marshall Bell was Sorvino's classmate the first time he went through. The show lasted a season. Sorvino would end up on Law and & Order and Goodfellas. Moffat would end up on Friday Night Lights and Barry on Justified. Hooperman. John Ritter, after Three's Company and multiple films, returns to TV as a police detective in a show that coined the term dramedy. The show was created by the team that created law, L.A. Law. Hooperman inherits a rundown apartment building and hires Deborah Ferentino to run it and sparks fly. 
Hill Street Blues vet Barbara Boson plays his boss at the police station. The show goes between solving crimes and humorous interactions with his co-workers. The series lasted two seasons and won an Emmy for comedy direction. Ritter would go on to two more series leads, Hearts of Fire and Eight Simple Rules, before dying too soon at age 54. A Year in the Life, NBC, not to be confused with the Gilmore Girls sequel. Mm -hmm. The trials and tribulations of a suburban Seattle family set up in a previous miniseries returns as a series which appropriately mm -hmm. lasted for one year. There's quite a cast here. Richard Kiley, a Tony winner. Adam Arkin, which, who went on to Chicago Hope. Sarah Jessica Parker from Sex and the City. Diana Muldor from Star Trek and L.A. Law. Kylie plays a recent widow with four adult children, all of whom moved back in. Kylie won an Emmy and Golden Globe for the role. In his acceptance speech, he said, I'm proud to accept this award for the show that TV Guide rightly calls the best show on television, a show that I only wish a few more of you had watched. <laughs> the Slap Maxwell Story on ABC. Dabney Coleman stars as a crusty sports writer. His previous series, Buffalo Bill, failed because his character was too abrasive, and his new show didn't learn from that example. The same creator was involved in both series. Megan Gallagher plays his secretary and sometimes love interest, while Susan Ansbach played his ex-wife. The Slap nickname is played up as his character is slapped in every episode. Not sure what ABC expected. Coleman's whole character was playing abrasive characters. The show lasted a season. Moving on to Thursday. Tour of Duty, CBS, the first TV series to portray Vietnam combat, but not the last, all influenced by the film Platoon. The series follows an infantry platoon, and along with combat, we see the lives of the soldiers and associated personnel. Terrence Knox, of St. Elsewhere, stars as a staff sergeant with a group of young actors, none of whom seem to have gone on to too much more of a career after that. In the second season, the platoon was assigned to a base near Saigon, which allowed the show to move away from constant combat, as well as add female characters. Kim Delaney, later of NYPD Blue, came on board. Ratings dropped, and the boys were sent back to the front for its third and final season. They just couldn't fight off the Golden Girls and Empty Nest on Saturdays. A Different World on NBC. The must-see TV colossus that was The Cosby Show spun off daughter Denise, Lisa Bonet, onto her own series based at college. It was the highest rated TV pilot in history with nearly 39 million viewers. The show originally wanted to concentrate on Denise's friendship with a white roommate, Marissa Tomei. Original pick Meg Ryan chose to move to film instead, but several factors changed that in its second season. Concerns that the show didn't represent an historically black college the fictional Hillman College, so Debbie Allen, Felicia Rashad, a.k.a. Claire Huxtable's sister, was brought aboard as producer who made a number of cast changes. Lisa Bonet became pregnant and initially was going to play a single mother on the show, but Cosby nixed that, saying that Bonet could be pregnant, but Denise could not, so she was returned to the mothership, then conveniently went on a long trip to Africa. Finally, Marissa Tomei left the series, as with Ryan, she moved over to films, winning an Oscar for My Cousin Vinny. So, the show now starred Don Lewis, the other roommate, Jasmine Guy as Preppy Whitley, and Kadeem Hardison as Dwayne. Sinbad was added as a coach, and a number of additional characters were added as regulars. Debbie Allen brought more relevance to the show. There were a lot of very special episodes. A young Jada Pinkett was added later in the show's six-year run, which was in the top five shows for the first four seasons. Being in the catbird seat between Cosby and Cheers did not hurt. Wise Guy on CBS. Ken Olin stars as a deep undercover FBI agent. He reports to a senior FBI agent played by Jonathan Banks and works with an informant played by Jim Burns. The show has a series of story arcs as Olin's character works his way through different assignments, generally with a new supporting cast each arc. Ray Sharkey played a mob boss. Kevin Spacey played an arms dealer. Fred Thompson played a white supremacist. Stanley Tucci played a gangster squeezing clothier Jerry Lewis. Tim Curry played a record mogul. By the end of season three, Olin left the series after a dispute with the networks over the direction of the series, and Stephen Bauer became the new undercover agent. It lasted only eight episodes after that. Jonathan Banks went on later to Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Then Friday, Full House, the heart of ABC's TGIF lineup for years, and a show now parodied endlessly. 
San Franciscan Danny, Bob Saget, is left to care for three daughters when his wife dies suddenly. So his brother-in-law Jesse, John Stamos, and buddy Joey, Dave Coulier, move in to help. Jesse's a rock and roller, while Joey is a budding stand-up. The daughters are played by Candace Cameron, Jody Sweeten, and the Olsen twins as Baby Michelle. Danny works at a local TV station, meeting Becky, Lori Laughlin, in the second season. Jesse and Becky eventually marry, later having twins. Various girlfriends and kids came through throughout the series. There's a lot of lessons learned, precocious kids, and oh, from the audience. The show was always a hit and never left the top 30 in its eight seasons, despite critics' judgment that the show was mediocre at best. The show generated a lot of merchandise, including a long series of kids' books featuring the kids. And of course, the show recently was rebooted as Fuller House on Netflix. Mark hates this show. He will scream and run from the room <laughs> if it comes on. Ugh. Beauty and the Beast on CBS. The start of a genre movement to modernize classic fairy tales, the show stars Linda Hamilton of the Terminator franchise as Beauty Catherine and Ron Perlman, later Hellboy, as Beast Vincent. She's a corporate attorney who is attacked and left to die in Central Park when he is a man with the head of a lion who finds her, taking her back to his underground tunnel world to recuperate. They fall in love and he protects her when she takes a job with the DA's office. They now have an empathic bond. Vincent's father, Roy Dotrice, is convinced that their relationship will allow the outside world to learn of their underground utopia, which is fleshed out throughout the series. In season three, Catherine is murdered, but not before having Vincent's child. Joe Anderson is added as a criminal investigator and the new female lead, but the show was quickly canceled. This mix of romance and fantasy come together partially due to one of the writer's producers, George R.R. R. Martin of Game of Thrones. The show was rebooted in 2012 on The CW. I Married Dora on ABC, a throwback to the We Have a Secret sitcom where the family has to keep a secret from the neighbors, see Bewitched, Mr. Ed. The show stars Daniel Hugh Kelly, previously McCormick on Hardcastle and, as architect Peter with El Salvadoran housekeeper Dora Elizabeth Pena. Dora turns out to be an illegal alien, so in true sitcom fashion, they set up a sham marriage to resolve the issue. Since this is illegal, a disclaimer in the first episode stated, you should not try this in your home. Of course, the sham turns into love, or would have, if the show had run more than 13 episodes. A young Juliette Lewis, later Oscar-nominated for Cape Fear, plays the daughter, and Jason Horst plays the son, presciently named Will Ferrell. Ooh. The show ended in bizarre fashion. Peter accepts a job offer in, in Bahrain, and leaves the family behind despite their pleas, he then returns and says, it's been canceled. The flight? No, our series. The camera then pulled back to show the set and crew all waving goodbye. You should find it on YouTube. It's hilarious. Private Eye on NBC. In what had to be a placeholder title that never got changed, Michael Woods and Josh Brolin star in a series from the makers of Miami Vice, this time set in the 1950s. Wood plays Jack, a former cop whose P.I. brother was murdered, so he takes over the business, meeting Johnny, Brolin, a stereotypical juvenile delinquent with a leather jacket who becomes his partner. The show was very violent, which, along with the generic premise, led to an early cancellation after 12 episodes. So let's recap. In 1987, out of 22 new series, 9 were hits. My Two Dads, Jake and the Fat Man, 30-something, Hooperman, Tour of Duty, A Different World, Wise Guy, and Beauty and the Beast. This was also the final year of the Big Three Networks, Ooh. as Fox was about to join the Fall TV Frenzy. And that certainly created a frenzy. Certainly. So go watch TV and check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics, on iTunes and other podcast delivery systems, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching.